Mr. Salalu Science Commissioner for Agriculture in Lagos State. Thanks you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. You know, uh, when you talk about agriculture, I don't know if um, I, if Lagos State will come top ten, <laughs> you know, or whatever. But um, in that regard, maybe I'll ask you a question my colleague asked you earlier. How stressful or convenient is this job? Thank you very much, and good morning to you all. Um, in terms of how stressful this job is, I think um, the question, first and foremost, should be directed at Mr. Governor, Mr. Babaji de Olushola Sonlu. How stressful indeed is it to run Lagos? So automatically looking at what he's done so far, I think he's done a phenomenal job considering all that has happened in the space of almost two years. So that translates into the rest of the team members also pulling the buck pulling their weight and ensuring that at least the Greater Lagos agenda is achieved. So with regards to stress, I think I've been coping quite well, considering where I was coming from in terms of the scope of work that I handled. So I feel that also the team I have in the Ministry of Agriculture, they are doing a phenomenal job as well in supporting and doing all that they should do. So, so far, so good. We are pulling our weight and we are praying to God Almighty to help us for the rest of the term. Mm. Quite interesting. Yes. Um, but one of the issues that's pre predominant in Nigeria today is insecurity. Well, that thankfully isn't something Lagos State is battling so much at the moment. But a good number of people have attributed uh, insecurity issues to unemployment. Yes. Now, Lagos State is perhaps not doing badly officially, but um, there, there are some other data uh, to methodologies used when you look at the international methodology that the NBS used say you know Lagos State is perhaps lowest uh, when it comes to unemployment but then there is another information that they call the new Nigeria methodology which defines unemployed labor force as those who did not work at all or worked for less than 20 hours a week and puts Lagos State at almost 40 percent much lower than some states like Oyo, Sokoto and the rest of them. Um, is this something that gives the state concern? So I think unemployment should give any state, any nation concern because when you have unemployed people then it means that the state of insecurity is also heightened. With regards to having about 40 percent of the population possibly working less than 20 hours in a week or in a month, what have you. I feel that, well, that statistic will have to be checked again because when you consider that Lagos is the largest market in sub-Saharan Africa, but being the largest market also and considering the African terrain, it's largely an informal market. What that also means is that majority of the people are into activities that are not fully captured, possibly into the tax bracket or even into the information pool that can be used for analysis for investment purposes. So you have a lot of people who are actually engaged. They could be manual laborers, they could be market men and women, they could be transporters, but they are not captured in some sort of data pool, which is why it seems largely that you have a lot of unemployed people, but by and large and in truth, they are actually employed. Yes, there's some level of unemployment and I think that is also a global phenomenon that we are battling with considering the COVID-19 pandemic. But with regards to what the Lagos State government is doing, we're doing so much around youth engagement, when you consider, for instance, the Ministry of Women Affairs and Poverty Elevation, when you consider what the Ministry of Wealth Creation, using the Legal State Employment Trust Fund, what they are doing, even the Ministry of Youth and Social Development, and so many other ministries as such that are, we are all collaborating and working together to ensure that in terms of what we bring forward, especially for the youth and for the women, we bring it forward in a holistic manner that at the end of the day, we can say that so far so good, maybe in the next one year, we are going to train, we're going to employ over 100,000, 200,000 people. So this interministerial engagement is ongoing and we are going to ensure that at least we mop up more people into the employment, uh, into the employment pool. Mm. You know, yes. Lagos has huge capacities, yes. but depending on how people look at it, some states, for instance, you think, well, Lagos, they can consume. So we yes. produce, we'll give them certain things to consume. Yes. Uh, others think, well, they will go hard on tax. Yes. They'll go after you if you don't fulfill your obligations in that tax. Yes. Give us this, that, that uh, what Lagos is, uh, what do I call it now? Agricultural, not just capacity, but what are they doing in terms of 
not just having that impression as though they're just a consuming state. Yes. What are they doing in that regard? So, um, yes, other states might consider Lagos as a consuming state. But like I said earlier, Lagos is the largest market sub-Saharan Africa has. Over 22 million in terms of population. When you consider even the food that we con consume on an annual basis, we are consuming foods well worth over 5 trillion naira. We are consuming foods well worth over 8 billion on I mean, a monthly basis, daily basis. So when you consider this pool of money, of these transactions happening in Lagos, it shows that, yes, we are the market. What this also means is that as a state, we don't need to delve into each and every corner to say we want to be number one in this or number one in that. As the largest market, that should be where our concentration should be. What this also means is that we need to organize our markets. That is the only way we can derive value. So how do you derive value? It is understanding the laws of supply and demand. Demand. If, as the largest market, you can enumerate properly that this is what you need for your state and this is what the transactional value should be, then you can begin to derive value, you can begin to draw an, uh, employment, you can begin to draw revenues, you can begin to draw even enforcement into a proper structure such that you begin to have a better Lagos, a greater Lagos. So what this administration of Mr. Babajide Olushala Songwulu is focused on is in terms of enforcing a market structure or bringing together a market structure that ensures a transformation in the food systems. So for instance, I require over 1 million metric tons of rice on an annual basis for my citizenry. What that means is I know states that are well able to produce this rice in large quantities. I'll look at a state like Kebi, I'll look at a state like Niger, I'll look at Kano. What I should be doing as a state is to say, if I need 1 million tons in a year, then I can tell Kebi, I need 500,000 metric tons from you for the next six months. That means I have a balance of 500,000. I can call on Niger, I can call on Kano and say, I need 250,000 metric tons from you each for the next six months. That means my demand for the year has been taken care of. What that also translates into is I know what quantities should be coming into the state. I know the people that this uh, quantities of rice should be going to. I know the transactional value. I know the revenue that the state should be deriving from this pool of product. And automatically, I can also be accountable to the citizenry to say, if this is the revenue that I was able to generate from 1 million metric tons of rice that has come into Lagos, then I should be able to account to you and say, from this revenue for rice alone, for instance, I'm going to do this road at, around Mount 12 area, or I'm going to do this road around Ido. That way, accountability setting, that is the only way Lagos can begin to move for. Aside that, yes, we might be a very small state, but we are still agrarian. What is um, a value chain of comparative advantage to us is fisheries. It means that I can begin to harness potentials around the fisheries sector. For instance, we demand over 400,000 metric tons of fish on an annual basis, but our fishermen and our aquaculture farmers, they're able to produce just about 174,000 metric tons. It means I have a deficit of over 200,000 tons. I need to bring in investors into the space. We need to go big in fish trawling. We need to start capturing fish. I mean, you have even Japanese coming into our coastal waters to do shrimp and what have you around fisheries, they take these things back to their country and export it back to us. It's ridiculous. We have this abundant water bodies around us. What are we doing with it? So these are areas where Lagos would like to concentrate, areas where we have the competitive and comparative advantage, like I said, in fisheries. Red meat, yes, we do not produce, but we would like to expand on what we can do within the red meat sector. Lagos consumes well over 1.8 million heads of cattle on an annual basis. We consume over 6,000 heads of cattle on a daily basis. When you consider the transactional value for cattle alone for Lagos is over 328 billion naira. But we are producing nothing. But what stops us from setting up ranches in the state? We are the largest market. It also makes sense that we set up ranches such that we are closer to market. We remove the logistics cost that, you know, probably increase. Yes, we are actually working on that and we'll be okay. rolling out an expression of interest next week nice. towards that, calling on investors. J j on that? Yes, yeah. on that. On the investors yes. thing? Yes. I, I just re realized, I mean, when you said you, the market value of agriculture in Lagos is... Yes. The almost food five value. trillion. Yes. Almost five trillion. Yes. On That's an almost basis. thirteen billion daily. Yes. Now, that's money. Yes, it is. And that's employment. Yes. Now, how easy is it to get into that? I mean, you talked about yes. you know pulling in investors. Yes. Now, if we look at all the red tips and all, getting into business in 
the country generally is quite an issue, ease yes. of doing business and all. Yes. So how easy is it for these investors you're calling to get in? Okay, so what the Lagos State Government is doing currently is to set up a one-stop shop uh, for any would-be investor to come in and be able to partner with the Lagos State Government such that in terms of setting up businesses, it's much easier. Yes, we know the ease of doing business index for Lagos has not been quite good, but we know that that is also because of bureaucracies that sometimes are outside of our control, which is why under the administration of Mr. Babaji Deolushola Songwe Ligin, we're trying to ensure that we are able to draw in investors in such a way and manner that they find it easy to do business in Lagos. So it's an interministerial affair, once again, where every MDA is also collaborating in areas where we know that, yes, for instance, if you want to set up an agro-processing center, for instance, it means you possibly require a Greek land. It means you possibly require some permits from the Ministry of Physical Planning and Urban Development. It means you possibly need to do EIAs and, you know, contact the Ministry of Environment. It means you have to, you know, touch a lot of uh, ministries and agencies to be able to get everything together to be able to say, yes, I'd like to do this business. So what we are trying to do is to say, you know what, we're going to set up a one-stop shop center as opposed to having to go to each and every ministry, trying to pay a fee here, pay a fee there, and everything is disjointed and it takes you so much time. Mm -hmm. We set up that one-stop shop. Everything you need around setting up an agro-processing facility, we make it available for you. So if it's a ministry, let's say for instance, a Greek, that has to take the lead in that area because this is now an agro processing facility, then we'll do everything that it will take to ensure that that person who is a major stakeholder for us is able to get this business to fly. Yes, it's not an easy walk in the park, and I'm not saying that maybe in the next one month, two months, it's going to, you know, all be rosy and dandy. You'll definitely find a few bottlenecks here and there, but processes like this take a bit of time before you find perfection in them. But we are working ardently towards it just to ensure that Lagos begins to become again mm. the destination hub, investment destination hub for Nigeria. You know, when you said bureaucracies uh, yes. outside of your control, I yes. was almost shocked because I thought you were in government. But I yes. think you mean other ministries, maybe. No, so not necessarily other ministries. So depending, if you say you want to set up some agro-processing facilities, obviously you need to take some approvals from maybe NAFDAQ, from SUN, and these are national agencies. They are not necessarily Lagos state agencies. So that's why I said bureaucracy can set in that is outside of our control. Okay, now looking at the figures, uh, yes. unemployment figures, I mean, you can't push them aside. I yes. mean, the, the, the MBS latest figure shows that Lagos has higher than average unemployment rate, 37%, and that's higher than what you find across the country, which is 33%. Okay. It just begs the question, maybe not in your purview, but something to chew on. How about yes. Lagos State have its own data? Yes. I mean, gather data such that you can show investors saying, yes. I mean, we have done our data uh, and we see that, well, there are at least more people involved, but that's by the side, maybe yes. beyond your purview. Yes. But in terms of uh, the Greater Lagos initiative, yes. I mean, what is Greater Lagos without food? Yes. And you need to feed people. You need to feed people that have I mean, people feed because they have jobs, right? Yes. And you talked about the value chain. Lagos might not have that luxury of, luxury of arable land, but there's still a value chain. Yes. What are those value chains specifically? Because I know a lot of young people that are just waiting to jump into these things such that they can at least feed themselves and provide jobs for others. So yes. what are those specific value chains? Okay, so you've asked multiple questions in one Let's start <laughs> from the value chain. So, uh, okay, so if I have to start from the value chain, so the areas where we have competitive and comparative advantage in Lagos, like I mentioned, fisheries, poultry to a reasonable degree, red meat because we are largely the market for red meat in Nigeria. You look at vegetables production to a reasonable degree also, yes, we can say we are good at that. Pigree, Lagos was number one, but then you had the uh, African swine fever that hit last year and it practically wiped out that entire value chain, but we are trying to resuscitate it. Uh, we're also looking at coconut. I mean, when you look at the crest of Lagos State, you see the two coconut trees and coconut on the ground. So Lagos also produces roughly about 70% of the coconut in Nigeria. So these are some of the areas where we feel that, yes, we have strengths and we would like to play to our strengths. In terms of unemployment and what we are doing as a state around it. I think what we should consider first and foremost, if you say Lagos has the highest unemployment population, 37%, I think that also um, comes from the fact that, I mean, you have a lot of people, you have a lot of internal migration around 
um, Nigeria, and they are all coming down to Lagos. There's nothing you can do as a state to stop it. We are a subnational. Nigeria is a sovereign nation. You can't stop anyone from coming into Lagos. So obviously, it looks like the unemployment statistics will continue to rise so long as there is nothing we as a state can do around stemming people from coming into the state. But what we want to do going forward, and not even going forward, we are actually working on that now, doing that now is to ensure also that across the different ministries, the stakeholders that we engage with on a daily basis, we are also doing stuff around capturing data enumeration such that if you want to even proffer solutions to the problems that the stakeholders face, you know what you're actually trying to proffer solutions to. You're not just trying to proffer solutions to problems that may not even exist. So what we are doing is each of my stakeholders, let's say, for instance, the Ministry of um, Women Affairs and Poverty Elevation, they know who their stakeholders are. Ministry of Wealth Creation, they know who their stakeholders are. That enumeration is done properly, and then you can begin to proffer solutions and see the unemployment gap in each of these areas. For us as a ministry, agriculture largely employs um, uh, about 70% of Nigeria's rural population, and it's not just Nigeria alone. Even in Africa, 70% of the rural population of Africa is actually engaged in agriculture, and majority of these people are women. What this also means for us as a state is, yes, we might be a very metropolitan state, metropolitan city, but we still need to feed ourselves. Largely about 80% of what we consume as a state is coming from other parts of the country. 20% is basically what we produce. But then for food security um, issues and going forward, we'll need to be able to produce more, which is why under our five-year roadmap, what we've done is to be able to see where the investors can come and partner with us such that we drive employment going forward. We drive large-scale commercial farming. We drive more value addition and processing into what Lagos is right now because essentially that is what we are good at since we have the labor, we have the capital as well. Mm -hmm. And in this way, we can begin to mop up unemployment in our space. But what we are also doing as a state is the Lagos Agripreneurship Program, which means it's no longer agriculture. It's no longer just about culture. It's no longer about tilling the ground. It's about using the likes of technology, smart agriculture, precision farming, and what have you around what we do in agriculture, stemming and getting into agribusiness. What we have seen in times past is people consider agriculture as a hobby or as something that they can retire into without necessarily doing the business analysis around it. It is a business. It's just like you being a trader. You know that if you buy this box of carton or this carton of noodles, you know what your profit margin would be. And that way you go into the business and you know the volumes you like like to do. Agriculture is also the same way, but it's just that it takes precision around it. If you are going to buy this level of input, you should know what your output would be, you should know what your market price would be, you should know what your margins would be. But a lot of people are not ready to do that homework before getting into it. And once they get into it and they see that, okay, I don't have what it takes, then they begin to look at agriculture in a very bad way. And that also permeates and percolates into society that this is not such a good thing to get into. But it's not. It's about you doing due diligence, doing your homework, knowing that this is what it takes to get in, this is what you get out, this is the margins you make, the profit you make, and then you can recoup that back into your investment. People need to begin to see that. And that is what we are teaching at the Agricultural Training Institute to our youth to ensure that if you want to get into agriculture, this is what it's going to take. But in terms of the possibilities, in terms of the potentials around it, they are endless. Well, no doubt government has a huge role to play yes. in, I mean, aggregating all this. Now, you have worked in the private sector for years, rising uh, to the top. Now you're in government and, yes. and I mean, you have the private sector that is cutting edge. You have yes. companies that they cut waste. You don't have a lot of bureaucracies. They are basically lean and they achieve a lot across countries. But yes. when you come to government, I mean, a government that is confined to just maybe a state or a nation, you have issues. An issue you don't have with conglomerates around countries. Why is it hard? I haven't tasted both <laughs> for both sides. Why, why is it hard, really, for government to be, okay. you know, cutting edge, cutting edge. cut okay. this, um, this wastage, just cut the bureaucracies? Why is it hard? Okay, so if you look at private sector, private sector is usually very focused. And when I say focused, it's usually one directional. So as a company, for instance, maybe a fast-moving consumer good uh, company, I know that, okay, this is the product, this is the target market, this is the uh, core operations of my business, and I just go for it and it's straightforward. 
I know those that I'm dealing with. And essentially, we understand what it takes in terms of the relationship between the company and the customer. And that is essentially to make profit. But then the company also wants to do it in a sustainable manner that they keep making profit over the years. As a government, it's completely different. It's a different kettle of fish. And the reason is this. You are dealing with people's emotions. You are dealing with people's needs. You are dealing with all strata of society. There's no particular target market that you are dealing with. You are dealing with each and every single person. And you are dealing with them not just from those perspectives alone. You are dealing with tribes, different tribes. You are dealing with different ethos and value systems, people with different principles, people with different values. So across board as a government, you need to bring all of these people together in a harmonious or to create a harmonious society. So it's a completely different ball of uh, uh, a game game uh, plan. So what that means also is that having to deal with these different people within the society is going to take a different um, approach. So what it means is that as a private sector company, you are focused and you know that this is the area and this is how you want to get at it. But for government, dealing with all the strata and these people within the society, you have to apply multiple uh, strategies, you have to apply multiple approaches. And what that means is, yes, it might look like things are slow, it might look like there's bureaucracy, it might look like, okay, things are not being done as fast as they should in the private sector. But you are actually here comparing apples and oranges. They are not one and the same. In addition to the fact that you're dealing with people who want to win elections. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's a different kettle of fish. Exactly. Yes. But as we wind down this one now, yes. uh, tell us briefly, if you can, okay. what, what is the thinking around, uh, say, standardizing the value chain operations okay. across board. Okay, so standardizing the value chain operations. I think uh, what this also translates into is that if you are able to standardize, then you set sustainability in motion. What it means is even outside of this administration, you have continuity and then people can begin to see value in all that we do, which is essentially what we are doing in this administration, to set in that sustainability, um, flexibility within all that we do, such that in terms of our systems and processes, there's continuity after even, you you know, we leave. What this also means is that as um, a ministry, um, if I look at the red meat value chain, for instance, I already have a plan in motion. I already have um, op operations and systems in motion around, okay, as a private investor, how do you come into this space? What are we as a ministry supposed to bring to the table? What are you supposed to bring to the table? What are the criteria that we will use in selection? And then in terms of the longevity of our transactions or in terms of the longevity of our relationship, this is what it's going to take. And after that, we'll know how to get there. So we are trying to bring this into each and every of our value chains. At the same time, each value chain has its own uh, peculiarities, which we also bring into um, all of our systems and um, processes around how we can ensure sustainability happens. So if you look at fisheries, for instance, the stakeholders there are completely different from the stakeholders in the red meat value chain. For the stakeholders in the fisheries sector, you're talking about the fishermen, you're talking about the aquaculture farmers. But then the investor is largely one and the same. If you're talking of the private sector person who wants to play in these fields and make money, the investors will largely be the same. But the stakeholders that are bringing the input for the private sector participants to be able to possibly, let's say, for instance, go into processing would be very different. So what this means is that we are looking at the peculiarities for each of these sectors or each of these value chains and also trying to bring them to a level where we can now begin to say, okay, these are now going to be an equal uh, playing field or a level playing field, and then the private sector person can come into the space. So across board... It's about dealing with the stakeholders in a different manner, bringing their peculiarities to the table, but bringing them to a level and to a standard that a private sector person can come in and deal with them on the same level. Maybe when you are able to make it a little more frequently, we'll be able to ask you so many other questions that okay. are on the list, but we cannot you know, yes. bring up now, because that thing you said about the red meat value chain, yes. I'm wondering what you're doing about the Agenge Abacha, but don't answer that question. <laughs> no, but I can actually go into <laughs> No, 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 we, we, we are completely out of time. We yeah, have to come to the question of interest from. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bisola Ulusoya is Commissioner for Agriculture in Lagos State. Thank you so much for your time and your thoughts. Thank you very much for having me.